and we're calling it Healthy Church. And that's what we're believing God for, is really God bringing health into His body. And uh, you have agreed with me for the last couple of weeks that in order for you and I to, uh, or in order for this church to be healthy, you have to be healthy, I need to be healthy. Right? right? It's just the way it is. We need to be healthy, and when we are healthy, guess what? We have one healthy church. Is that the way it is? Amen. And so last week, uh, we looked at the word devotion or devote. And I want to just remind you what that means. Because the first verse in verse 42, they devoted themselves. What does this mean again? Well, devotion means simply this. Give all or a large part of one's time or resources to a person, activity, or cause. Let me just repeat that. <coughs> Devote or devotion is, it simply means to give all or a large part of one's time or resources to a person, activity, or cause. So last week, we, could, we saw that the, the, the believers have actually devoted themselves made a huge commitment to, uh, to grow in knowing God. And basically, they were just studying and learning and sharing of what Jesus had taught them. And so they were learning about God. And the second thing was that they devoted themselves to fellowship. And uh, isn't it amazing last week of, of what God had uh, shared with us about the beauty of different cultures? Because really... In, in this country of ours, that's what I love about our country, is that we are pretty much just, uh, in, in front of us are different cultures, especially in Reno and California and on and on. Uh, and so, how do we fellowship, when the Bible says to fellowship, how do we fellowship when you have different cultures? Well, the thing about it is this, is that if I do understand that God created cultures, that he's the mastermind of your own culture, he created it, then when I look at you, when, I, when you look at me, we should appreciate of how God created you and created me. Different cultures. He created it. And then so I have to, to respect your culture, you have to respect mine. I cannot enforce my culture to you. You cannot enforce your culture to me. But here's the thing. In the midst of all that different cultures, we can find commonality. And the commonality is our faith and love to, uh, for Jesus Christ, right? That's a commonality. That if I look at you with a different culture, I know you're a sister or a brother, guess what? Man, we get to share our faith together. And all of a sudden, that we can now fellowship because of that commonality. And so, not only that they have devoted themselves in apostles' teaching, in knowing God, and also in fellowship, the third thing was that they made a, devo a devotion to prayer. They were devoted not only in those things, but also to prayer. So, isn't it interesting that the believers understood the importance of prayer? Well, why is that? Well, in the book of Luke chapter 11, the, the disciples were having a, uh, basically they saw Jesus praying. And, and when they saw Jesus praying, they kind of thought, hey, prayer is probably important because Jesus prays. And so, in the book of Luke chapter 11, verse 1, tells us one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Why? Because they saw Jesus praying. When they saw the Savior or the Lord praying, they were like, man... I don't know how to pray. So I don't think anybody else knows how to pray. And they're like, no. And so he said, Lord, teach us how to pray. We want to learn it because it seems like it is, it is important to me. And so, therefore, Jesus taught them how to pray. And so they grew in their prayer life. And then Jesus now went back up to heaven where he came from. And then all of a sudden we can see in the book of Acts that they continued this practice of praying. But this time, because now they have learned how to pray, now they brought it to a community, like a corporate, corporate prayer. So in other words, what we see here is that they devoted themselves 
not only to the apostles' teaching, into fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and then now to prayer, which is they were having uh, some kind of corporate prayer. They were praying uh, for each other. Uh, they were basically they were praying for each other's needs. They saw the value of praying for each other. So they were praying in homes. They were praying in churches. Wherever they were, the believers were always praying. So we can see that this was a priority. So praying as a body of believers, you and me, should be a priority. Amen. It should be a priority. And why is this important for us to pray for one another? Why is it important for us to establish a corporate or community prayer? Well, number one is this. Because when we pray together with other believers, the effects can be very positive. Yes, amen. Think about that. Can be very, the effects can be very positive. I don't know about you, but when people pray for me, when, when I pray for others, man, the effects of that is so positive. Mm -hmm. Unless you have someone praying for you that don't know how to pray. That's a different story. <laughs> Uh, but it really brings uh, uh, so much of positiveness in the life of a person. The second thing I think is this, is that it edifies and unifies the church. Corporate prayer edifies you and me. It unifies us as we share our need in our common faith. Think about that. It, it, I mean, I don't know about you, but, but when people pray for me, it, it really it edifies me. When people, when I, when I receive a text or an email or a call, and, and people say, I'm praying for you, Pastor. I want to tell you today that really edifies me. It edifies my wife when, when, you, when some of you would do that to her. I mean, it really edifies us. Well, what about you? Do you think it edifies you when you receive a text or a call or someone praying for you, knowing that someone's praying for you? Absolutely. Amen. It edifies you, and not only that, it unifies us. Yes. Thirdly, is that it encourages you and me. When we pray for each other, it encourages you, it encourages me. That's the, 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 the blessing of having a community prayer or a corporate prayer. And then, this is, the last one is, I think it's really important. When we pray, when we have a community corporate prayer, it shows that you love, or it shows that we love one another, and that we are concerned for each other. Think about that. When you pray, when you say, when you hear the pastor's in need or sister Lisa's in need, and then you start praying for us, I know that you that you love me, that you love my wife, that, that you are concerned about us. And when we pray, right, for you, and, and you find that out, you know that we love you and that we are concerned about you, right? Amen. And the, that's the beauty of having a corporate prayer, is that community prayer. And... Um, I really want to see our church to grow in this area. I really do. I really want us that when we hear of someone in need, that we would immediately just pray. Amen. And we can't be too busy to pray for others. Because it's not about me, it's not about us, but it's about God and it's about God using us to pray for others. Because they need to be edified, I need to be edified, and I've got to know that you love it, and really, you have some concerns for me, and vice versa. That's what the family of God is all about, that we know, that I know, that you know, that we care, I care, you care, we care for each other, we love one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And that's why it's so vital for us to pray for one another. Immediately, when you hear someone, when you hear someone in need, don't just rush that off and say, you know what, I'm going to take the time to pray for my sister right now. Yeah. And then when you see that person, I, you just tell her quickly, hey, I just want to let you know, I pray for you. Imagine that would do to a person's life. And then prayer activates the power of God. Prayer activates the power of God. I just want to show you what I mean that prayer activates the power of God. Paul 
in one of his writings to the church in Ephesus, in chapter 6, he said, put the full armor of God. Yes. And what, he, what is he talking about? Why did he say that? Well, the reason being is because of our battle. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. That's it's right. a, against the evil dark, darkness forces, whatever. And that's what we're battling with. And he said, put the full armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel of peace, have the shield of faith. And then he said, have the, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, we tend to stop there. We tend to just look at the full armor and we stop there. Well, we, you cannot neglect the next thing he said. He said, pray. After you put on the whole armor of God, then pray. Amen. Why? Because prayer activates the power of God. Amen. So when you have the, 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 the armor of God on, guess what? Then... Then you plug yourself in <laughs> through prayer in the Holy Spirit, right? I want to tell you that praying is not power. <clears throat> Let me say that again. Prayer is not power. Holy Spirit is power. Hallelujah. What you and I need to do is to connect ourselves in the power of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden, bam, you have power.
And then I want to talk to you about the power in the Holy Spirit. So prayer, they devoted themselves in prayer, and now it says in Acts 2.43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, we got to understand the background of this, because in the book of Mark chapter 16, Jesus <clears throat> uh, said these words. He said, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. So this passage speaks about uh, the disciples and, and what they were about to experience. What were they about to experience? The power of the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts chapter 2, and it, and it came on them, and guess what? They began to do some incredible things. Why? Because now they have the power of the living God. And so that's why in Acts 2.43, it tells us that they were performing many signs and wonders, and people were in awe. So, these miracles and signs and wonders were happening regularly. It was happening almost every single day. And uh, so I just want to tell you that... In order for you and I to start believing God for a miracle, because how many of you know that we always believe for God's miracle, right? Whether that's uh, you know healing, whether that's blessings or for His provisions, that's whether it's a, a freedom from any addictions, pornography, whatever, freedom from that, uh, freedom from <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, freedom from from your past and, and anything. We always ask for a miracle from God. Don't we? Amen. You guys just have to pardon me, okay? And uh, just uh, I'm having some tingling in my throat, and I have to slow down a little bit. <coughs> Jesus' name. All right. Commercial is over. <laughs> and so, here's the thing. You and I are always believing God for a miracle. But for you and I to start believing for a miracle, we must understand one thing. One thing. And that is that your God and my God is a, is a God of what? Power. He's the all-powerful God. He's the all-powerful God. And you and I, we need to understand that he is the all-powerful God. And that <clears throat> and this all-powerful God lives in you and me if we have placed our faith in the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, I, I just love what Brother Gail said because it's really a confirmation of, of the message this morning. That the power, the God who created all this, the entire universe, the heavens and the earth, the all-powerful God who said the great I am, I am the great, I am that I am, lives in you and me. And uh, it realizes that if we know that this God, who is all-powerful, lives in us. Would you agree that this power is absolutely available to you and me, this church? Right? Yes. Yes. Anytime. Yes. Hallelujah, yes. That means that we can draw power from the life of Jesus anytime we want. Yes. <clears throat> and the, uh, the apostles understood this. The apostles understood the power that was in them. <coughs> they understood it. In fact, they were walking around, they are living their lives, understanding that the incredible power of God was in them. 
<clears throat> and because of that, everyone was in awe. So the question is, are miracles, signs and wonders, are, are they still available for us today? Well, the last time I checked, in Hebrews 13, 8, tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. That means that this God of yesterday is the God, not only of yesterday, the God of today, the God forevermore. That means that he has not changed. He is the all-powerful God yesterday, he's the all-powerful God today, and he will be the all-powerful God tomorrow and forevermore. Amen. Right? And so, yes, miracles are happening every single day. Now, let me just ask, let me just tell you this. Don't put your faith in power. Put your faith in God who has the power. Hallelujah. Let me just help you there. Amen. Because a lot of times they go after power and they go seek power. And God is saying, don't seek the power, seek me, the God who is all powerful that has the ability to give you power, right? Yeah. I gotta slow down for my throat. <laughs> but this is uh, this is what my friend Ruth and Pastor Eric did. <coughs> that they put their faith not in power, but in a God who is all powerful. Yeah. Pastor Eric and Ruth, <laughs> uh, uh, a week prior to Christmas, Ruth, my friend Ruth, the wife was inside her house when all of a sudden she heard a huge bang. Huge bang! And people just outside were screaming and just out of control. And all of a sudden she went outside and then all of a sudden on her left she saw her neighbor, the boy who was nine years old, was hit head on by a truck. And he flew 50 feet away from where he was hit. Immediately, the Holy Spirit spoke to Ruth and said, go over there and pray for life. Pray for a miracle. And so she immediately ran towards that boy. And when a couple of other people was checking on this boy, his pulses and, and, and if he was breathing and all that, and they declared, he's dead, he's not breathing, there's no pulse. And so they were just like out of control, just yelling and screaming. And the dad was just hysterical. And he was just out of control. <clears throat> but Ruth went down to the boy. And she began to rebuke death. And she said, I come against you, death, in the name of Jesus. I declare life, life, Lionel, life, come Life, right now, life, and she was speaking life on and on, and then all of a sudden, the dad was just so hysterical. The pastor, Eric, God spoke to him and said, speak to him and tell him to, to, to call on the name of Jesus. And he didn't know how to speak Spanish because the family was Spanish, Hispanic. And so he was like, I don't know how to speak Spanish, when all of a sudden, he began to speak Spanish. Wow. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, call on the name of Jesus, call on the name of Jesus. And the, the dad was like, oh, Jesus, and whatever he said in Spanish, I'm calling you on your name, I'm calling on your name. And while Ruth was praying, declared life, Jesus, life, life, life. And all of a sudden, the boy took a gap. Wow. Well, when Lionel went to the hospital, the doctors could not believe that he survived this. In fact, he had a cracked skull, fractured spine and hip, broken ribs and many other things. And the doctor declared, this is the work of God. That's not it. Yes, but it's God. But that's not it. Four days later, Lionel left the hospital. Ooh. And here's a picture of Lionel. Lionel is at the bottom picture with that little girl on the wow. left. And that's my sister, my friend Ruth, and that's the dad up, uh, up on the right. 
And guess what? <clears throat> that was Christmas. Lionel today is walking and been healed completely. Oh, <coughs> that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. You ready for this? Yeah. Lionel and the entire family went to church last Sunday. Amen. Yay. God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament is the same God today. He still brings the dead back to life, folks. He's still God. He's still the all powerful God. Woo! Yes. Hallelujah. And I just want to tell you today that this people stood in awe of the power of God. Why? Because Sister Ruth said it's the power of God that brought this boy back. And the dad, when he called upon the name of Jesus, you know what? Guess what? He understood the power of Jesus. Amen. They stood in awe. I'm like, my boy's alive four days later. He left the hospital. He's walking around and playing. Really? It's the power of God. Amen. And so the people in the book of Acts stood in awe of the many signs and wonders that they saw that the disciples were performing. They declared it's the power of God. <laughs> Can I tell you something? <clears throat> that this power that in the apostles is the same power that is in all of you. Yes. This power, listen to me, <clears throat> this power that comes from the Holy Spirit not only has the power to do miracles, not only has the power to, to do signs and wonders, he also has the power for, uh, for uh, power to, to destroy your fears and worries, uh, and to destroy your past. Uh, if you are captive by your past, he has the power to destroy that. He has the power to destroy. Well, if you think that you have been dealing with depression, he has the power to destroy that in your life. He has the power to destroy anything, any storms. He has the power to calm your storms. He has the power to set you free from your addiction, from pornography, whatever. He has the power to, to really even touch your mouth from, from cussing out all the time. He has the power to do anything at all, even your thoughts. He has the power to do that. He is the all-powerful God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he has the power to give you that voice. Hallelujah. Because, boy, I was just struggling earlier. But mm -hmm. I'm better. Amen. 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 I want to just tell you today, friends, the God that you and I know has the power to save your lives. Amen. So what do we do? Don't give up. While you're, while you're still breathing, don't give up. Yes. Amen. Don't give up. Don't give up. Can you tell your, your neighbor, don't give, don't give up? Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't stop believing God for miracles. Amen. Amen. You continue to believe God. <laughs> Don't stop. And so, how do we apply this into our lives? Well, I believe the first one is this, is that make it a goal for you to grow in your prayer life. Make sure that you establish a solid prayer life. That means that you now start reading the Word of God. And don't just read the Word of God for the sake of reading it, but allow it to speak to you. Hallelujah. Allow the Word of God and say, okay, I'm reading the Word of God. <coughs> what are you teaching me right now yes. from this passage? Amen. Allow me to understand it. Allow me to see it. And allow the power of the Word of God to transform me. <coughs> then pray. But you got to establish that. And then, the second thing is now you understand the importance of prayer, of, all, of having a personal prayer life. 
Now you understand that? Now you come and be among your friends and say, I want to pray for you. Or I heard that you are in need. Let me pray for you. Hey, I just want to let you know I pray for you. Are you with me? Because we can't be too busy <clears throat> to pray for others. And then secondly is this. Always remember that power, God, that power I'm talking about is God Amen. who lives in you. Amen. Don't ever, ever put your faith in power, but put your faith in God yes. who has the power. Amen. Yes. Why? Because there's so many Christians that are going after power, signs, and miracles. And they're out there just doing cuckoo stuff. Why? Because they're going after power. They, they're putting their faith in power instead of putting their faith in God who has the power. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. I've been to many of those uh, revival and, and supposedly having, you know, God's power and presence and all of that. But I want to tell you, it's counterfeit. Yes. It's counterfeit. <coughs> and we don't have to go after those powers. Don't put your faith in power, but put your faith in God who has all the power. You with me? Amen. Amen. And then train your mind, speak it, and act it. Because you know that the God who lives in you is the all-powerful God. Guess what? Train your mind. Train your mind, speak it, and act it. Yes. Don't go to your little closet and having a pity party. Stand up. Get up. It's time now. Yeah. Yeah. Did we see this today? Yeah. Oh, 